Well, for those of you who have benefited from a look at the words of Mary uh, over this series, Praise God, and for those of you who haven't, good news, we're almost done. Um, Christmas is coming one way or another, and uh, we're going to move uh, from Mary and the spirit of expectation to the reality of the Son of God coming to the world. We're in week three of Walking with Mary, as she's told she's going to have this special son. And there's no doubt that Mary is an impressive young woman. <clears throat> I'm sure you have, just as I have, been told many times how young uh, Mary was. Just a word on that. Uh, scholars tend to say she was no older than 15, maybe 14, and maybe even younger. Well, that has always seemed really young to me, but never so much as now that I have my own 15-year-old daughter. <laughs> I think I see a 15-year-old daughter right here. And I kind of just goofing around in my office, just started writing down names of girls in the church. I think we have at least 12 that are right at 15 uh, years old. And um, it has moved from surprising how young she was to troubling <laughs> to think of this young, young child being given such a dramatic role in the story of the redemption of mankind. Mary was clearly a special young lady. Well, we've been looking at Mary's response to this angelic birth announcement that she receives and I've made much of her faith in embracing this big news. And I've pointed out that it, it's been a full embrace, no um, holding back. Uh, and maybe you wouldn't think that would be a big surprise. What's the big deal? She's fully embracing good news. I mean, who doesn't embrace good news? But she didn't have to take it as good news, did she? Have you ever tried to give good news and not have it taken as such. I came home uh, the other week and said, I've got great news. We've got a new treadmill. <laughs> and then there's a little murmuring about dad's motives in coming up with this treadmill. He's going to make us run on the treadmill. Of course, I won't make you run on the treadmill. But wouldn't it be a lot of fun? Just because you have good news doesn't mean it's always received as good news. Don't you think Mary could have received it as something other than perfectly good news? It wouldn't have taken much spinning for her to see this at least as mixed news, if not bad news. Almost like you could imagine the angel Gabriel appearing to her and saying, Mary, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news for you. But Mary has a little thing called virtue. She has perspective. She has godliness. And today I want to look at a little bit of where that comes from. We've been looking at the Magnificat in Luke chapter 1. Uh, you can put your finger in there. Uh, I'm going to move you around a little bit. We're going to look at Mary's response again to her new plight. Uh, she has her visit from Angel Gabriel and then she takes this long trip all the way down to visit her cousin Elizabeth, and her sense of joyful wonder is only confirmed as she meets up with Elizabeth, who gives this Holy Spirit-inspired welcome right at the doorstep. And then Mary, in response, just lets loose in praise. Well, that passage, again, is called the Magnificat. Her soul magnifies the Lord, magnifies. That desire for art magnifies is where we get the name Magnificat from. Well, we'll jump back to Luke chapter 1, but I want to take a brief look at 1 Samuel. Would you open with me to 1 Samuel? And actually, I'm going to need the page number for that. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Two twenty six was that Diane again? <laughs> well, 
225, 226, somewhere in there. You could tell Dan's the most competitive person we've got here. All right, these are the words of Hannah. Do you remember Hannah? Hannah gives birth to who? Samuel is her son, and Hannah is barren. She's having a hard time conceiving, and she kind of makes this deal with the priest Eli, right? That if she could just conceive and give birth, she's going to give this child to, to Eli, and he will take care. Uh, she'll, she'll lend him back to the Lord. Um, so here's what she prays as she gives. She's actually had Samuel. She's weaned him, and now she's giving Samuel to Eli. And this is her prayer. First 10 verses of 1 Samuel 2. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My, route, my mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven." The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now, for those of you who have been here the last couple of weeks, does this passage remind you of anything? It's a lot like Mary's words, isn't it? Not every point uh, is made in Mary's that Hannah has made, but there are a lot of parallels here. Um, I'm not the first to notice, and I've got a, a few uh, points just to mention right here, hopefully on the screen. Hannah says, my heart exalts in the Lord. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. She, Hannah rejoices in her salvation. Mary rejoices in God, my Savior. And then they both have a reference to the holiness of the Lord. And then there's this you know, the mighty will be broken. The mighty will be brought down, but the humble will be exalted. And then a very clear, similar reference here to those who are hungry will be made full, and those who are full will be made hungry. And really, there are parallels all through the rest of Hannah's song. She's going to go on to say, God is a God of grand reversals. Some are on their way up and some are on their way down. The lowly will be exalted, and the wicked will be brought to their demise. Well, understand this. Mary's walk with the Lord has been helped with a friend. That's Elizabeth, right? She's a friend, a cousin, a mentor. Mary's walk with the Lord has been helped with the walk of Elizabeth. But it's also been helped with the walk of Hannah. She's been helped by Hannah. Now listen, Mary, she didn't have a Bible wherever she went. I know my kids now, when they do their Bible reading at night, um, they do them on their tablets, right? Some of you maybe don't even know what a tablet is. It's one of these electronic 
uh, little things. Um, I do my Bible reading on a phone. How many of you guys are looking at a phone even this morning? Okay, a few of you. Paul is. How many, I meant how many of you are looking at the scriptures on your phone, Paul? Oh, he's, <laughs> he's pointing it up. It does look like scripture back there. Um, it's just so amazingly convenient for us to have the scriptures today. In the history of the world, the availability of the words of the Bible that we have, it's staggering. The Bible is staggeringly accessible in our lives. Well, Mary, she just grows up in the synagogue. She goes to the synagogue and they read from the scriptures and they learn. Well, if that's Mary's Bible, just going to the synagogue, well, Mary's not just going there. She's not just showing up. She's not just going through the motions. She's listening. She's thinking, probably asking questions and pondering on what she hears. There's much that she gains from Hannah. I don't know if she memorized Hannah's plight or if she just knew Hannah. She just had the categories in her mind. And when she needed Hannah, she knew she could reach out to her the same faith that she had. I doubt she needed to ask her rabbi for counseling. <laughs> I don't know what he would have done if she had said, what should I do when he heard her story? But part of what makes Mary so productive in her times of reflection, why she doesn't worry and fester and think of all the dreadful what-ifs that could be a part of her plight. Her inexperienced and immature thoughts get better with time because she's walking with someone like Hannah. What are you doing, Mary? Oh, I'm just hanging with Hannah. If just once your kids would have an excuse like that <laughs> when they're late. Um, Mary has heard Hannah's story. She has internalized it. Imagine what it would be like to be in her shoes. And she could imagine having the exact same faith that Hannah had in her situation. And when she needed it, it was there within her reach. Hannah here is giving things over to the Lord. I mean, she's turning her, think of Hannah. She's turning her son over to someone else to raise him. I looked at my Bible at 1 Samuel there, and the very, next heading, uh, the very next heading in the passage after Hannah's song, it says, Eli's worthless sons. And she's handing her son over to this guy. Um, she's got great faith that the Lord is in this and has planned it. I know when I uh, went to college, uh, we just spent so much time in the Word. It was uh, new for me to just think about God's Word so much and to be taking classes. And then we'd come back to the dorm room and um, think some more, and we'd discuss things, and we'd debate. And it, it was just such a neat time of spending time in God's Word. You just felt like you were dwelling in the Word, as my professor had said. And in those times... It was really neat. As you would experience life, it would be like texts would just kind of come to mind. Just as you're living life, all of a sudden, another text would come to mind and another text. And then when those texts would come to mind, you'd, you'd want to know where they were, you know, to remember and, and, and be able. So then you'd search out, where was that again? Something about this. And all of a sudden, the Bible started to become alive and active in my life. And people started to say funny things like, are you going to be a pastor? <laughs> and I, I'd always say, no, not wanting to be a pastor. Apparently, they wore me down over time. But why would you ask if someone was going to be a pastor? Why not just a Christian? Someone that dwells in the Word, knows the Word, and can just see the Word coming forth in the different aspects of their life. Mary's like that. 
she experiences something new and, and the Word just comes alive. And to her, characters of the Bible just came alive. I had, I've had a couple people lately that have uh, said to me a kind of an odd expression. They're talking about devoted Christians. They'll talk about somebody else and they'll say, you know, they're trying to say that person is a devoted Christian or that person is very serious about their faith. But instead of saying it the way they use this expression, they say, they're a real Christian. Not a real Christian, but they're real Christian. You know, like it's some label. They're, boy, they're real Christian. Um, oh, that all God's people would seem like radicals. <laughs> that would seem like they're um, so devoted to their faith. And the sign of that would be that God's word would just be um, evident and clear to them, and not merely a cultural Christianity. That works maybe on sunny days, but when the storms of life come, you need more. You need more. You need the Lord and His Word in your life. Well, Mary's been here before. She's visited with Hannah. Uh, they've had very different situations and yet they've both been desperate in a lowly estate, and they have both looked, been looked upon with favor. Well, I suspect Mary is praising the Lord first and foremost, but I'm guessing she's also communicating something to Elizabeth with her song. You think so? They both share in the plight of Hannah. Hannah's even been barren, right? Hannah might even have a closer connection. Uh, Elizabeth has been barren. She may have, may have a closer connection with Hannah. And I'm guessing Elizabeth understands and is delighted that Mary is there as well. Hannah is a blessing to them both. Her faith will be theirs as they begin their new adventure. Well, we're almost to New Year's. And, of course, New Year's is a great time, right, to make new resolutions. And many have perhaps in the past done a read through the Bible. I had a buddy, we did the chronological uh, read through of the Bible. Has anybody ever done the chronological one? That's kind of a different way uh, to go about it, and it's good. But I kind of felt like I'm encountering the Bible, but not making it my companion, like I'm going, it was kind of fast. It was good, and it's good, I think, to get the big picture. But this year, I've decided each month, I'm just going to take a book of the Bible and try each day to just spend time in that book and to dwell with God's Word in that way. Don't merely have Bible encounters. Make a companion of the Bible and the stories of faith that are contained in it. Um, but just as a word of caution, it can be life-changing. <laughs> be careful. Now, before I let Mary go for Christmas, I just want to tease out for a bit the fact that although there's a whole bunch that Mary does know, we've commended her for a whole bunch of things she does know, there's quite a bit that Mary still doesn't know, right? Let's turn back to Luke chapter 1. Mary adds something to the themes of Hannah's song. Something that Hannah might only hint at. Verses 54 and 55. At the end of Mary's song here, she says, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. What's that a reference to? Mary recognizes that her plight is intertwined with the fate of her people. God is not only looking down on the lowly estate of her life, he's remembering his covenant in talking to little old Mary, God is remembering His covenant to Israel. 
He is helping his servant Israel, it says in verse 54, in remembrance of his mercy. So he's remembering something, and she ties it back to our fathers, right? He's remembering the covenant given to Abraham and to his offspring forever. So the angel Gabriel stated this mission quite clearly. Look back down to verse 30. All right, where does Mary get this idea? She gets it from uh, Gabriel very directly. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He, and here's what, listen to what's said here. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. All right, now Gabriel is relaying, relaying to her old promises. These are old promises. These words are from actually 2 Samuel chapter 7. They're like a thousand years old. And Mary, in hearing these promises from a thousand years old, she knows they really go back to the days of Abraham, which is 2,000 years old. So Mary's receiving this as welcomed promises for her people. And I think it's important as you go through the story of Jesus that you understand Mary and the state of her people, right? In the misery of Israel's disobedience, they have been subjected to countless bouts of oppression and exile, right? I mean, we got 2,000 years ago after Abraham, you have 400 years in Egypt. And then even as they come and walk in the wilderness, it's constant oppression, right? It's disobedience and and then finally, when they get into the promised land, it's more disobedience and more oppression again and again. And God will raise up deliverers, Othniel and Ehud and Barak and Gideon and Jephthah and Samson. But ultimately, disobedience comes back and the oppression comes back. They have had a spirit of misery forever. And then, of course, later will come the big exiles into Assyria, for you guys this way, and into Babylonia, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. It's just been oppression. That's who Israel is. And their desire for a ray of hope, for a period of peace, will be a major theme. They have had a ray of hope and a period of peace. They've had a number of them, but none ever quite as bright or quite as long as the reign of who? David. And the hope of Israel, the hope of Israel in the days of Mary are going to be this promise that Gabriel gives right here, that another son, a son of David, will come and reign. And his reign will be forever. It'll be forever. Not just another little glimpse of rest. Not just another little glimpse of peace. But when this son of David comes, there will be an eternal rest. There will be a reign that will never end. When is he going to come? And as Mary receives this news of the baby that's to be born, she's told, he's the one. He's the one, and that's part of her rejoicing. But there will be confusion as to his mission. There will be a strong sense that this Messiah is going to bring what kind of peace? Political peace, military peace. His kingdom is going to be right here on the earth, and he's going to establish it and keep it with the sword. There will be confusion. There will be signs of desperation in how they respond 
to the coming of this Son. Anything for enduring rest. People do funny things when they're desperate, don't they? I was watching a show online, and it kept having a commercial. And the commercial was a minute and a half long, so you couldn't help but by like the fourth time, I'd, I'm repeating back the commercial. It's the same commercial every time. Um, but it was for a drug, um, Belsamra. Have you ever heard of that? It's a drug to fight insomnia. And, uh, of course, the first half of the advertisement is all how amazing it is and how it works and what it will provide. And there's this attractive actress that is moving around and, and somehow sleep is, uh, in, it look, it's like a cat, but it's in, in the form, it, it's in the letters of sleep or rest or something. You've seen this. And, and you just get this, ah, oh, you know, rest is just the most wonderful thing. I think it refers to it as the companion that you've been missing or something, you know, this cat. Um, this rest. I don't know if a cat is good imagery for you, but it worked for this commercial. Well, that's the first half of the commercial. All right. What's the second half? Side effects. Side effects. All right. Here they, here they went. I mean, this is 45 seconds. I think it was 50, but I'm giving them a little, sparing a little bit. It said, don't take Pelsamra with alcohol. Okay. And it kind of begins with some you know, rather benign uh, concerns there. I don't drink. Not a problem. Okay. Um, while taking Belsamra, don't drive or operate heavy machi machinery until you feel fully awake. Well, okay, now we're talking obscure things that I don't have to worry about. Um, but, of course, that one might be a little harder with the next side effect, which says walking, eating, driving, or engaging in other activities while asleep without remembering it the next day, have been reported. <laughs> so you're going to kind of turn into a zombie, but everything else should be okay. Then it says, abnormal behaviors include aggressiveness, confusion, agitation, or hallucinations. You might want to not just check with your doctor, but also check with your spouse before you take Belsamra. And then it said, temporary inability to move. <laughs> I think they call that paralysis. <laughs> While falling asleep or waking up, and temporary leg weakness have also been reported. In depressed patients, worsening depression, including risk of suicide, may occur. And then they end with side effects include next day drowsiness. I think they wanted to end with kind of a soft one there at the end. All, of, all the while, this beautiful actress is getting her rest. Well, why would anybody take this drug? Why? You know that it must be a desperate state to struggle with insomnia, okay? It can get at least to a desperate state. I know I've had difficulty sleeping at times when my mind is flooded with things, but you talk to some others that have really struggled with it. You know, it must be a desperate state, okay? Well, when Jesus is going to come on the scene, people's impressions combine with this desperation, for freedom from oppression is going to show itself some really strange behavior. The mission of Mary's son will be confused. That's why the crowds will grow impatient and try to make him king. And why even John the Baptist will eventually question his mission. Are you the one or should we expect another? And why Mary herself and the sons will look at his ministry and wonder if he's gone mad. That's just in Mark chapter 3. And why the Pharisees and the Zealots will find him so expendable. And why Judas will grow impatient and eventually betray him. And why Peter will draw his sword at their arrest, at his arrest. And why the disciples will scatter when it happens. And why the crowds can move from rejoicing one day as he enters Jerusalem and crying out for his crucifixion. Only days later, 
and why the disciples on the road to Emmaus will find him to have been a failure. These are days of desperation. Oh, there's a lot left to be learned by Mary. All will become clear. It will be revealed in time. For now, what Mary understands is enough. Verse 56. She just sang her song or stated her poem. And Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months and returned to her home. Oh, Mary. It's almost like the climactic conclusion to a song. One thing I liked about being in the band was concert band. I was a percussionist. When you could finish the song with the timpani, nothing better than finishing a song with the timpani. Boom, 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 boom. At the end, and then it's like silence. Applause. And then you leave, right? And you go home. I feel like for Mary, the song is over, and it's time to get back to real life. Time to leave the blessing and shelter of Elizabeth and go home. She's been with child. Well, it's three months later now. She's likely showing, or perhaps will be soon, her trip to Judea will surely look like something very different than what it was. People will be talking. Her worship will now be mixed with looks of shame. But Mary will be fine. She has Elizabeth. She has Hannah. She's going to find out she still has Joseph. And more importantly, she has the God of them all. Her story has just begun. She knows that generations will look back upon her and say, not broken, not burdened, but blessed. What favor. What a great and faithful God. Let's stand together as we close in prayer. Lord, we do have good news. There's good news to be told. All that Mary understood, we have the chance to understand. And all that Mary couldn't understand at this time, we now know. Lord, I pray that the hearts of your people would have that pure, unadulterated, clear praise of your Son. And we would just rejoice in who he is and what he came to do. And may we as Christians, though we certainly have many things we're not happy about in this life, uh, may we be marked by joy. May people look at us and say, not burdened but blessed. May our lives tell your story. Draw our hearts to you this Christmas season, we pray in Jesus' name.